Welcome back. Well, I was hoping to have a project for you today because it's Sunday and I like doing projects on Sunday. But the project I had in mind was a painting project and unfortunately it's too cold to paint. Uh, painting really is something that has to be done at a certain temperature. And so if it gets below something like 40 degrees or above 90 degrees, you don't paint because that affects the consistency of the paint, the drying time, things like that. So instead, I've kind of got a twofer for you. Uh, we're going to do a shopping video uh, and this is going to be an abbreviated shopping video. Uh, everything in this video, everything that I bought, all of the pieces, the total came to under $10. So that should be fun. And then I thought I would spend a few minutes answering some of the questions that some of you have been asking, uh, particularly about um, management of uh, online shopping. So when we come back, we're going to get right into it. So this video is still part of the shopping trip I did at Bedford last week. Got a lot of stuff, too much for a single video. So as I mentioned before, everything, all of the stuff under $10. Uh, because I do want you to understand that you can get terrific deals at antique malls, better deals in some cases than you could get at thrift stores. Now the thrift stores in my area generally price their things under $10. Uh, small collectibles, figurines, glassware, etc. is usually in the range of a $1 to $5 and you don't get into higher prices unless it's larger items like lamps or even going up into furniture, which they do have at some of the local thrift stores. So everything here is rock bottom thrift store prices. So let's start with a little booth. And as I say in the film, this is a booth that I I'll poke my nose in, but I hardly ever even step over the threshold because ordinarily they just don't have things that appeal to my market. But they did this time. So let's take a look. Well, this is a little booth that I usually don't come into because um, sports trophies and souvenir glasses, it's, it's not my market. But 40% off everything, that is my market. So, we'll slide over here. This is a beautiful little Japan Spaniel, $4, 40% off. That makes it $2 and change. Nice bargain. Yes, that little Spaniel puppy was $2.40. Um, what was it? $4 and then 40% off that. Nice little Japanese figurine. It's almost certainly going to go to a, a Spaniel owner or the friend of a Spaniel owner who is going to give it to a Spaniel owner because people who are attached to their dogs, their cats, their birds, whatever, really tend to like to collect little things that look like their pets. And I, I think it's great. Everybody should have something they collect. It just keeps you out of trouble. And this was just a really beautiful, well-executed, mid-century Japan figurine. So $2.40, oh my yes. Uh, after that, 
I scooted across the aisle to another one of Paul's cubbies, and I found a really sweet piece. So let's take a look at that one. So, Paul, yet again, a very pretty little transfer wear bowl, very good condition. That lacy pattern is really nice, and of course, $3, the price is making it even more attractive, especially because this is a good size bowl. What is this, about six inches across and at least four inches tall? with a little foot on it. So, I'm seeing everything from potpourri to the morning breakfast cereal. This is a nice piece. That bowl was a sweet piece. And I don't do very much with transfer wear. Uh, part of the reason is I don't often find good transfer wear pottery. The reason for this is it was always um, um, less expensive, less desirable, less um, sort of fancy and lala than other kinds of pottery, even within the range of um, utilitarian dishware. Uh, you could get a lot of bang for your buck with transfer wear. Um, the same pieces that would be coming out of the, um, the large pottery houses, and they were just all over the place in the early 20th century, they would cost a lot more than transfer wear because transfer wear was inexpensive to make. Good, solid, durable, pottery. And part of the reason that I don't deal with them is because usually by the time they are hitting the secondhand market today, they've gotten a little dinged and nicked and beaten up. They generally are not in great condition. And this piece was in great condition. And I'm assuming the market for this is going to be uh, a collector of American country pieces. Uh, you see that a lot. Um, American country as a decorating style. It's not my thing, but I, I have some friends who have executed these designs beautifully in their homes. There are a few standard colors. Uh, navy blue, burgundy red, sometimes hunter green, off-whites, grays, it's, it's a limited color palette. You don't see like pink and orange combinations. You really don't see fire engine red. You see more of a subdued blood red. And a piece like that with that nice red design on the bowl that has it was off-white now. I It may have been more white earlier in its lifetime, but at this point it's off-white. That is going to go very nicely into an American country style home. And these pieces were meant to be used. They were made to be hardworking and durable. So I was perfectly fine with that at $3. Now, Let's look at another piece I found. This was also in a booth I rarely go into. So let's take a look. I don't think I have ever purchased anything from this little booth before. Generally speaking, it's not the sort of things that, that I sell. But... Oh, I did. I got a teapot in here once and it was very nice. So let's take a look at what I got today. Let me start off with the great news. The price is a dollar. This is a little pot bellied stove on feet and it is some sort of container. I don't know what you would put in this, 
basically you would put anything you wanted to in it. It's a kitchen storage piece. Very nice touch. It has a lock lid. That's this little bit of flange here and it goes in and keeps the lid from just popping off. There's a tiny bit of damage, just the littlest nick right here. And what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to clean it up and put a bit of a clear top coat on it. The reason I'm going to do that is to keep it from chipping any further and to keep it clean, frankly. And the damage is exceedingly minor. The piece is only a dollar. And somebody is going to want that for whatever kind of storage. You know, I'm thinking tea bag storage would be great. So, coming home with me. Okay, so I'm not even sure what this piece is. I'm going to call it a canister because I have no idea what else to call it. Uh, maybe it's a cookie jar. A pot-bellied stove with a lid. Beautiful piece. I'm, I was just really surprised. Condition is excellent. It's a cute design. The colors are, are bright and lively without being over the top. And at a dollar, oh my, yes. Uh, that's an excellent price not just because of the quality of the piece, but because of the size. It has been my experience, and I don't know what your experience has been like. I don't think mine is just limited to this area. But in shopping, in general, looking for used items, my experience has been that the larger the item, the higher the price. Smaller items go for less money. I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's just human nature and sort of, oh, look, it's big. Let's put a bigger price on it. I don't know. But that's a good sized piece. Condition, as I say, excellent. And for a dollar, oh my yes, I will buy things like that all day long, even if I don't know exactly what they are. Because the new owner, is going to look at that and say, I know what I'm going to use that for. And it's probably something I never even thought of. So, uh, and that's one of the great things about selling items. People will occasionally write me back notes and say, this is what I'm using it for. Um, and let me give you an example. I had a little uh, creamer that was in the shape of a Native American head with a full war bonnet and so on. In fact, I picked up another one of those. And the buyer wrote in to say that what she does with that is she uses that for her grandson's cereal milk. She puts the milk in the creamer and he has his little Indian creamer and he creams his own cereal. And apparently this is just a thing that he enjoys and it's something grandma did for him that's special. And I love the thought that, you know, 50, 60 years from now, that kid's going to remember that little creamer and how much fun he had. Because putting milk in your cereal is such an ordinary, mundane, run-of-the-mill thing. And if Grandma makes it exciting and interesting for him, well, bless her, she's making memories for him. So, as I say, things I never would have expected. So... Um, another piece, and once again, this was in another booth that I usually just sort of glance around, but I don't often buy in this booth. So it was my lucky day for finding interesting things in places I don't usually frequent. So take a look. Okay, remember this booth? Right back there is where I found some beautiful uranium glass goblets. Um, actually, they were little sherbet cups. Um, beautiful condition. Oh, like sensational price. I don't remember. I think it was like a dollar a piece for them. 
and here's another one dollar item it's a very pretty piece i'll have to get it out in the light it looks like it might be lusterware if it is lusterware it's european lusterware not japanese but this little sort of i don't know that is some kind of plant that i can't identify anyway very pretty it's got some wear along the edges no actually that's not wear that's just where the glaze didn't fully cover unmarked for a dollar oh yes coming home with me that little picture was just the sweetest thing it's probably european it's large for a cream pitcher, so I do not believe it was intended to be cream for cream in your coffee. Um, if it is a cream pitcher, it was probably intended to be cream poured over your berries or something like that, where you would be using a lot of cream at once. And, and again, these are syrup pitchers, honey pitchers, whatever it is you might want to pour and you might want to put in a pitcher. They had pitchers for them. But that was a wonderful piece. Um, I'm still eh about whether or not it's actually lusterware. Lusterware, as I've explained before, has a metallic content in the glaze, and that's what gives you the luster. But a lot of European pieces have very little metal in the glaze. It's enough to give them a bit of a shine, but not enough to get that full iridescent in your face luster. The way the Japanese pieces were done and the way many of the German Czech Bavarian lusterware pieces were done. So lusterware, maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. But for a dollar, oh my, yes wonderful deal on that. And coming up, our final piece, and you will recognize this, I'm sure, because I did a whole video on this. This is one of Paul's little cubbies. Okay, I'm sure you'll remember this cubby from a recent video. I did half my shopping out of the cubby. Here we go. Mid-century piece. Very atomic. Two dollars. Oh yeah, coming home with me. Well, that bottle, I'm, I'm not even sure what that bottle was originally used for. A nice glass bottle, nice mid-century atomic design on it. Um, I, I don't know what one put in that originally. But I can see that holding absolutely everything from, you know, jelly beans to loose pasta. Um, obviously, that's going to end up in the hands of a mid-century collector because mid-century is the sort of thing that people either love or they hate, one or the other. A lot of people from my generation are just mid-century makes their skin crawl, mostly because it's what we grew up with. And we sort of, not just us as a generation, but we as a society rejected that mid-century atomic thing in the late 60s when everything was, you know, like... Oh, macrame and lava lamps and, you know, potted, potted plants were huge, especially in, when you get into the early 70s. We were getting away from better living through chemistry and moving back to, let's get back to the earth and back to green and, you know, and of course, then we move past that as we always do. But it's a great piece. It has classical mid-century designs on it for two dollars yeah so everything you have seen total was ten dollars well not even it was nine dollars and sixty cents it was under ten dollars 
for all of those. And if I were to throw those pieces up to auction on eBay, there's no telling how much they would bring in. Would it be more than $9.60? Oh my goodness, yes. So anyway, the point that I'm trying to make with this is the deals can be found. And going into antique shops, for a lot of us, that's a sort of difficult proposition because we're thinking, oh, well, it's an antique shop. The prices are going to be sky high. Antique malls tend to be a little different because they have owners of the different little booths. And if you catch them at the right time, when they want to move their stock out, they will throw up a 40% off sale. So good deals can be had. So now, speaking of what to do with your stock that doesn't sell, I recently got a question about this. What happens when things are sitting in my Etsy shop for too long? Well, I have this, everybody has their own way of doing this, by the way, and it's not like my way is the right way. It's just that my way is the way I do it. If I have things that have been sitting around and it's moving on to three months, so if it's been there for like two months, no interest in it, I drop the price. That's number one. I would rather sell it. Um, if I drop, uh, yeah. I would rather sell it than have to donate it to a Goodwill where it might end up in the bins, for one thing. But I have a, a sort of bottom level price. And I won't go past that because I had to pay for it. I've had to pay for the listings. So I have an amount of money tied up in this. And if it looks like I'm not going to be able to sell the piece without going below that bottom threshold, then what I do is I pack it up and I donate it. Now, I'm very lucky because in my area, we have a sort of charity thrift shop um, giveaway place. It's a small shop and it's run by veterans for veterans and service people. And they take donations. They have a little shop. Uh, they And they take all kinds of donations. I've donated foodstuffs to them. Um, and I did that back when the pandemic was making it difficult for people to get things. Because what they do is if you go in and you see something on their shelves and you want to buy it, you buy it. But if you are a military personnel, active, retired, you know, discharged, whatever, in need, and you see something on the shelf that you need, and you just go and say, I need this, and they give it to you. And that's my idea of a charity. So, I love being able to support that place. I would really love to be able to get in there more often and, uh, and donate. No, this is not the sort of place I would buy from. And the reason for this is because I, I buy for resale. And people have always said this. It's like, well, why would you buy from Goodwill when people need it? Because Goodwill is charging for it no matter what. What do they care? Who gives them the money? A place like this, when they're actually giving the things away, yeah, that's when I have a moral problem with going in and buying something that somebody else might show up 20 minutes later and desperately need, knowing that the shop will simply give it to them. So, um, that's how I support the charity, by making donations and not by buying off their shelves. So, and that's a very personal thing. I'm not saying that the people who go in there and buy those items are doing any wrong. They're not. They're going in, they're buying items, they're giving people money. This is what it's supposed to be. It's just for me, it's 
a little more complex, I guess. And that is because, as I say, I have no problem buying things from stores if that's what their primary purpose is, selling items. But this little store, their primary purpose is helping service people. So, yeah, it's, it's different because their business model is different. So, that's what happens to things that hang around a bit too long. My hope is, of course, that I will bring it in and they will be able to sell it and they will get some money for it because most of the items I sell in my eBay shop are more inclined to be luxury items, not things that a person in need really must have. So if they can make some money and then go off and buy something for someone in need, fabulous, win-win right across the board. Okay. Next little question, and um, this one came up recently. Someone had asked me, when you are on Etsy, how do you do a reserve listing? Well, you put up a reserve listing the same way you put up any other listing. You know, you go in and you create a listing. What I do with mine, and again, this is just what I do with mine. Do it your own way if you want. What I do with mine is I don't put any information about the item. I will put reserved for Mary, and that's the title. And then I will put the price, and the only other thing I deal with is whether or not I'm paying the shipping or the buyer is paying the shipping. Other than that, everything else is blank. No description of the item, uh, no pictures of the item. I use a picture of Audie, who, of course, yeah, we've discussed this before, is not for sale, mostly because I don't own him, he owns me. The reason I don't put a description of the item is because, theoretically, anyone can go in and buy your reserve listing. If they see something, and it can say reserved for Mary, somebody else goes in and buys it, it may not necessarily be Mary, the one you are reserving it for, who has purchased it. And as a seller, it can sometimes be very difficult to figure that out. Um, people, uh, and I've noticed this from my customers all the time, uh, when they contact me and, and write little notes, they will sign it off with a nickname or something like that. And then their actual shipping address will have their full formal name, or it will have a husband's name or a wife's name. So, can you end up shipping out your reserved listing to the wrong customer? Absolutely. So, I find as a seller, my best protection is not to let anybody know what it is. The only person who's going to know what that item is, is the person I'm reserving it for. And so that eliminates the possibility of shipping the item out to the wrong person. Just that simple. Um, I do not customarily do a lot of reserve listings. I have found, and again, just my experience. I have found that it's something that I really enjoy doing for my regular buyers, people who come in, check out my shop and, you know, or people that I know from videos because they've left comments, etc. So I feel like there's a relationship. Um, I know. I, and I make fun of those kids who say, I have 5,000 Facebook friends. It's like, what, what, what is a Facebook friend? Please. But there is a relationship that exists there. It may not be the same kind of relationship that we all grew up with when we would walk to school together or whatever, but the person is not a complete stranger. If the person is a complete stranger, I usually will not. Um, I will do reserve listings for people that I've done business with before or that I've had enough correspondence with so that, um, so that I, I'm comfortable doing special business with them. I guess that's the easiest way to put it. 
Uh, and when you start to look at uh, how you how you relate to your customers, it should always be at least a little bit personal. Um, one of the other things that I occasionally do for people that have purchased from my Etsy shop and I've gotten to know them and their taste, and that's key. When I see what somebody buys, I start to get a feel for their taste. Um, ordinarily, I do not do personal shopping. If people say, will you find this or that for me? Usually the answer is just going to have to be no, because I don't know their taste. But occasionally, especially with repeat buyers, I have a sense of what they like. And so I'm comfortable doing that. Um, buying uh, buying sort of on, on prospect, if you will, is it's a dangerous idea for a seller. Because if you get something that you think someone's going to like and they don't, well, you've bought it and you're stuck with it. So that's the reason behind that. So, all right. Um, hopefully, this will have been enough information to make up for the lack of project and enough fun shopping to make up for the lack of project. When we do our next Sunday video, I really, really, I've got a painting project that mm, I am so itching to get started on that. And I would love to be able to do it. Hopefully next week, the weather will be better. The temperature will be above 40 and I will be able to paint. Because when you're painting, you have to paint in a ventilated area and ventilation when it's 25 degrees out, no, your paint doesn't like that. So hopefully we'll get right back on track with projects next week. Okay, meantime, have a great day. I will see you all uh, Thursday with book club, etc. And then we'll just cycle right back into our usual video schedule on Friday morning. And I am going to throw a little slideshow at the end of this, but right now I'm not sure which one it is. I'm going to see which one appeals to me. All right. Have a terrific day and we'll see you next week.